Father, we come again and thank you um, for your many blessings again. Lord, we can't thank you enough. And um, we just come and thank you for you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And thank you for your word. And thank you for the local body and the universal body that you call the church, the body of Christ, which is the organism you are using today to get your work done in the earth. And we thank you for allowing us to be part of your family and uh, the privileges. And as my wife says, we get the privilege to serve you. We get the privilege to do these things. And we thank you so much for that. So, Father, as we get ready to get into the word now, um, it is a difficult portion of scripture. It's hard to understand. There's some uh, things that are going on here that are different, some things that are going to change. And so, Father, we do pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will have his way. I pray for all of us, Lord, that you would speak to each one of us right where we need to be spoken to. And I just pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will just totally envelop and dominate me. And Lord, totally envelop and dominate our hearers today and that he would have his way in all of our lives. So Father, uh, grant us to say what the text says and not be afraid to, and Lord, not to say more than it does say and not to speculate in any way as well. And so Father, we thank you for what you're going to do today in this text. And so Lord, we're relying upon you. You are the teacher, you are God, and uh, I am not. And whatever gifts I have, they have been given to me for your glory and honor. So we pray that you will use them um, just like you want to use everybody's gifts who are in this sanctuary right now. So, Lord, thank you, and we just commit our time to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, our scripture reading is going to be coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll be reading the first eight verses, and this is all brand new material, so I want you to really engage brain, as they say, and continue to think, and uh, let's see what God has for us today. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Addressing Immorality in the Church. For the first four chapters, Paul's been addressing pride. He's been addressing divisions. He's been addressing cliques. He's been addressing arrogance, insubordination, disrespect. And all of that's going on in the Corinthian church. And he's been addressing that. Last week, we read a passage. We studied a passage that had irony in it, sarcasm, and some strong words. The Paul let the Corinthians know he was not trying to shame them, but he was trying to put something in their mind. He was trying to admonish them or warn them. And what was his goal? I want to put some things in your mind that will change how you think, which will result in changing how you live. And so that's, he said, I wasn't trying to shame you. I was trying to come to this thing. I want to change how you guys are living. So he lets them know that he was a little harder on them because he loves them. He loves them. And so as we got into it, we had to study it a little deeper that he's saying, I love you as a father does his child. And for some of us, we had to dismiss what we have in our brain as a, how a father loves his child. And you want to see a father loving his child the way God intended fathers to love their children. And so fathers loving their children, fatherhood, fathers in, um, um, influencing their children is a good thing. God designed it that way. We're in a culture, we're in a time where we don't see it that way anymore. 
I've told you before, there are certain areas of our city that on Father's Day, pastors don't even do Father's Day messages. Fathers are absent. There's a bad taste in my mouth toward my father. I hate my father. I don't know who my father is. We have those type of things. And so we have to remind us, as we did last week, we're talking about fatherhood, God style, and it's a good thing. And we're going to have to go back there and we're going to have to find out what God intended for fatherhood and not give up hope because of our culture and because of our nation, but to keep our eyes focused on God and his ability to change every man and woman from the inside out. Amen. And so we looked at that. He says, God loves you and he designed this fatherhood thing. And I had to get on you and so to speak, and it was all balanced, not abuse. I had to get on you guys because I love you, because I'm your father. I'm the one that God used to bring the gospel to you so that you got saved. I'm your spiritual father. And so we learned last week that a much-loved child will mimic or imitate his father. They just do that. I want to be like my daddy if I feel my daddy really loves me, okay? And we talked about it last week. Your daddy is God until he works himself out of that job, amen? And when he works himself out of that job, then that's when we get all these other attitudes. But your, your, your daddy is, is God until you prove to him, or he proves to you that he's not. And so we looked at that, and so he said, um, much loved children, they imitate or they mimic, they follow their fathers, and then he says, I want you to follow, imitate, or mimic me. I want you to follow, imitate, or mimic me. I want you to follow, imitate, or mimic me in what I teach, my doctrine, my beliefs. And then I want you to follow, imitate, and mimic me in how I live out my beliefs. So he said, I want you to imitate me. And he said, and just in case you've forgotten, it's been maybe three to five years, he said, I'm sending, sending Timothy to you. He's another one of my spiritual children, and he's going to remind you of my ways so that you can mimic me better. And so he said, I'm sending Timothy. And so that's where we left off last week. And he said, I'm coming myself. And we explained that there were some people in the church stirring up a bunch of mess. And he said, I'm coming myself. Don't think I'm scared. I'm coming myself. And he said, I'm going to have to work with some folks that need to straighten up or fly right. And he's saying, I want to encourage you, straighten up and fly right before I get there. And then I won't have to deal with you. I won't have to deal with you. And he said, I want you to make a choice today, make a decision. You choose how I'm going to come. Are you gonna straighten up and fly right so I come with gentleness, or do I need to come with what he called a rod, where I have to say, go out there and get me one of those branches off that tree. So he's saying, I want, which way do you want me to come? You choose, and I'll come that way, okay? And, and that when he says that, there's no more, there's no abuse there or anything like that. I just need to be, he's saying, I just need to be more convincing. Sometimes we need a stronger hand and God designed fathers to sometimes bring a stronger hand, amen, to bring a stronger hand. So that's what he closed that chapter out telling them, you know, make a choice about how I'm going to come. And so that's where we, we left it last week. So now we move into chapter five, and I've already said it. I know I'm repeating myself. We're changing gears now. For four chapters, we've been focused on the things we mentioned earlier, and now we're going to change gears. And so now we begin a brand new section, and it just seems like we just jump into something, you know? We just, we jump into it. And I told you, this is going to be challenging. So now we're going to be dealing with some um, immorality in the church. Paul is going to address immorality in the church. And so as we get into it, the first thing we're going to see here in the first five verses is literally that he's addressing this immorality. So I'm going to read those first five verses again of chapter five of and I'm going to start at verse 1. Listen very carefully. Try to hear it as if you've never heard this before in your life. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind that does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and, when, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. As we get into verse 1, we can kind of break verse 1 down this way. 
He's bringing out the gravity or the seriousness of this immorality. He's telling us what's going on. And then the immorality is defined. So as we get into it, he gets there and he goes, you know, there's some immorality that's been reported. This is going on. The people know about this. Now, as far as we can tell, trying to stay as tight to our context as we can, he's talking about the people in the local body know this is going on. Okay, this is, this is what he's saying. And so let's break it down. You are the local body today, each and every one of you. If this letter is being read, a man standing there reading it, what Paul is saying to the audience who is listening, what would be you, is that there's some immorality that's being reported and it's going on among you all, among their plural. So it's saying, so what you'd be sitting there saying, oh, it's going on in our church? Then you would ask yourself, do I know about it? Or, yeah, or, you know, if you knew about it, you might go like this. You know how we do that body language? We start turning and I need to go to the bathroom maybe. Or, you know, I hear a baby, pinch the baby so the baby can cry so I can leave. Um, whatever it is, it, it can make you uncomfortable. But he's saying there's some immorality going on right there in your church there in Berean. And you, the members who attend there, who are sitting in the pews, you know about it. That's what he's basically saying there. And so he says, this is an immorality that um, it's so deep and so serious that it does not even exist among the Gentiles. And what he means there is the people who are not saved, the people who don't, ain't trying to be saved, don't know nothing about Jesus, don't know anything about Yahweh, they don't even do this kind of immorality. Amen? Do you know that there are just levels of, what shall we say, uh, those of you who've worked in the prisons, those of you who have ministered in the prisons, folks done killed two or three people, done, uh, done all kinds of things. But you better not let this type of offender be out there alone. They have standards even among evil people that have done all kinds of things. And when you go to minister, there are certain people that can't go outside. When you're, if, you, if you're preaching outside, they can't go outside. There are certain type of offenders. There are rules and regulations. There are lines that even the most evil of people have. Everybody has a line. Are you following that? And so he's saying the things that's going on in your church, people outside, these, these people who are just plain old pagans, they don't even do these type of things. Okay, so now as we get into this, I want to keep the history here because this can be, it can sound a little bit misleading. We're talking about the Roman Greco world. Now when we get into here, it seems that what he's saying is the Romans have rules. They have laws. You can't do this. You can't do this. This is, a, this is a fence. This is a crime to do what we're talking about here, what we're getting ready to break down. He said, the Romans have that. Because see, the, the Greeks, it didn't matter who you did things with. It didn't matter what you did. There were no rules and no regulations with them. If it was your boy, your girl, your mama, it, there were no re re rules or regulations with them. Whatever I want to do, if it feels good, do it. And ain't nobody going to criticize you about it. Do your thing. Do what you want to do. That's how they lived. But the Romans did have some laws, too. They did some very wicked things. You know, Nero had little boys, and he had that, that type of thing. Sometimes folks in antiquity, their relationships were homosexual. You had a wife, but that was so you could have your kids, but your real relationships were homosexual. Your relationships were with children. You did those type of things. And these are the rulers. The, these are the big shots. This was normal. You would have a relationship with somebody in your family. This was normal. I know you think man we really live in some rough evil times we do but folks they were even rougher back then maybe these things are happening in our country but it's sure underground right now back then it wasn't underground that's just what you did it was a very very evil time a very very evil time and Christianity comes into this talking about raise your children be a good father and this was the shocker and love your wife huh love your wife I just have her for making babies, that's all. Love her? Sacrifice? As Christ loved the church? This was all new. Christianity brought this in. Are you seeing this? And so he's saying this is an immorality that the pagans, the Gentiles, the unsaved people don't even do. That someone has his father's wife. So he breaks it down. What are we talking about, Paul? We're talking about a man who is either having 
Shall we call? So, so I, got, I got a young crowd today, so we're going to go here. We're talking about a man who has frequent wrestling matches with his father's wife. Got me? Say amen if you understand what I'm saying. Or we're talking about a man who did more than have frequent wrestling matches. This man went on ahead and got a place and married his father's wife. Okay? So it would be a stepmother. He's got this inappropriate relationship with his stepmom. And there were other people that did that all the time. No big deal. But this is going on in the church. And evidently, he had some kind of position in the church where, as we go back to our illustration, you and I knew about it in the church, and we never said anything about it, and we didn't say anything to him about it. Hello? This is what's going on here. Got an amen? Are you still there? Okay, I'm trying to be careful, so I may not be as... Um, jump around as I normally am, okay? I'm trying to be real careful with this text. And so that's what's going on. So he defines it, okay? He's saying there's some immorality going on, okay? It's sexual immorality, and it's, it's, it's some serious sexual immorality. And here's what it is. Someone has their um, father's wife. It's a stepmom thing, okay? It's a stepmom thing. So he's defining this immorality. There's a, a way that um, it could have happened, but it's still wrong, but you know, God has the things he put down, and then man always comes up with his own things, right? So the rabbis, they had a thing in, in place that if you, you were a Gentile and you came into Judaism, now we're not talking about Christianity, we're talking about Judaism. If you came into that as a Gentile, you were what was called a proselyte. You became a Jew, okay, by religion and all of that. And so they had rules in place that if you were a Gentile and you became a proselyte or you became a Jew, all your family relations were out the door. It's as if you were a new person and you didn't have to worry about your family relationships anymore. So it's possible that this man may have come out of something like that and he's like, I've always kind of had a little something something for my stepmom and I, I, I'm in the proselyte thing and now I, I, I don't have to say she's my stepmom. I can start over as if she's not related to me at all. There's a possibility that may have happened. But now he's into Christianity. And you need to understand, Christianity and Judaism are not the same. Okay, they're not the same. And so this thing is continuing to move forward. Possibility that something like that happened, and that's how this might have got started. But any, either way we, we talk about it, it's something wrong here. Something's happened that's been wrong. So as we get into it, please feel it that that happens here. I'm that guy and you guys see me, nobody's ever said anything to me, nobody's ever thought that was wrong, nobody's ever confronted me, they've just allowed me to do this in church. Okay, are you seeing what's going on here? And so it's very, very serious. So now, as we go on, we go down to verse two, and we're going to get into some more attitudes here. As we get into verse two, we're looking at these attitudes of the church and then the improper response to the church. Um, to the man, excuse me, the improper response of the man. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that no one, oh, excuse me, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. So Paul's still reading, he's still reading, they're still listening, and he's saying, okay, check this out now. You have become arrogant. They were proud. They didn't, they didn't confront the situation. They were proud about it. You know, um, there are some possibilities that they, they got into it. Uh, my freedom in Christ. Have you ever seen how we can use my freedom in Christ to do what we really want to do? Galatians teaches, don't use your freedom in Christ as an excuse to indulge your flesh. You know, using that to do whatever you want to do. So you can do the freedom in Christ. This is one that's very relevant to us. Maybe they were proud that we're a church that's tolerant. Are you living where we're living? 2023 Christianity is being attacked as not being tolerant. And so churches are changing. We are tolerant. We're sorry they treated you like that. We are tolerant. They might have been proud that they were tolerant. And if you haven't gotten the memo, that is coming to a church near you because being tolerant is what our culture wants us to be. Tolerant, tolerant, tolerant. You can still have church. Just be tolerant about it. Amen. You can still be on YouTube. Just be tolerant about it. Another one of my favorite speakers got took off the other day on YouTube. Because they're taking you off. You say something about certain things, you're out of here. 
So you have to, you know, if you want, you have to be careful. So most of the good people have an alternative place they can go. So when they get taken off of YouTube, you can still find them. We're not being tolerant enough. Perhaps this church was being proud of being tolerant. Okay. You want to be proud and you want to, if you can want to be proud of something in a good way, be proud that you're loving, but you're speaking the truth in love. Don't let the culture convince you that tolerance is where you want to go. Amen. That tolerance is where you want to go. And so he's getting into, he says, you become arrogant. You guys are proud. Instead of being proud about it and advertising how tolerant you are, or how much grace you're under and, and how, you know, you guys get to you really accept everybody and all of that. He's saying you should have been mourning, grieving. Hello? This is foreign to us, isn't it? Is it foreign to you? I know many in our, our congregation right now are grieving. Certain times of the year, you've had loved ones who went on and you miss them and you're grieving. But do you ever talk to anybody that's grieving because there's sin in the church that they attend? Not really. You? We don't hear anybody grieving about that. We hear grieving about buildings. We hear grieving about other things, um, other issues, but we don't hear grieving about sin in the camp. Do we? It's foreign to us too. And so he said, you should be grieving about this, this sin that's going on in the camp. That, and, and, and then your grief should have caused you to do something. You have these emotions which cause you to do something. You have a mindset, an attitude that caused you to do something. And he said, the right thing to do at this particular time in history, where we are, is you are to put that person out of your church. So to keep this illustration current with what I'm saying, if I'm that guy, you are supposed to put me out of here if you don't see any repentance. You don't see no change. I'm not changing. I'm doing what I want to do. You are to put me out. Are you following this? Now, as we get into this, excuse me one moment. I want to make sure we are balanced. We're not talking about you and I struggling with a sin, falling into a temptation and we are open about it, we want to change. How can you help me in my life? We're not talking about that. We're talking about straight up, in your face, this is what I do, and ain't nobody gonna do anything about it, and ain't nobody saying nothing about it, and ain't nobody getting in my business, and I'm not getting in your business, that is your business, and whatever you do is your own. That's what we're talking about, you know? Because we have to really work with this as we grow. We're all growing, including me. Many of us live in self-protection. We're keeping our stuff quiet. We're not sharing our stuff. We're, we're, we're going to keep it quiet. Um, we're, we're all growing. We, 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 if we're not, church seems like a place where you go sit next to the person next to you and you don't share that you have struggles in your life. You don't share you have addictions. You don't share that, that you've got anger issues. You don't share whatever it is. You just keep it because everybody's looking good and feeling good, but they're not good. But we don't feel safe to really say who we are. Do you understand when we get into the book of James, it says to confess your sins to one another. And it says, you know what? It'll help you heal up. Sometimes what we need is to share. You know, we need to share. And we're not talking about sharing something with somebody that's gossiping and you know they gossip and all that. No, no, we're not talking about that. But there should be somebody in your local body that you can talk to in confidence and you can say what you really think and you can share what's really going on in your life. That includes the pastor too. Amen. We want to be there, but we're in self-protection. We don't share. Um, we don't tell people what we're doing or not doing. And so we want to be challenged to be a body that's a safe place for, our, for us to share our warts and to share our problems and to share those type of things. Amen. We're always talking about sharing the praises and the good things, but we don't have anything that's not good happening. Sometimes we need to talk to someone, and that is supposed to be what the local body is about. There are seven motivational gifts in the local body, and if everybody's using their gift, there should be no needs. And one of those gifts is exhortation. There are people in the church who have a spiritual gift to encourage you, get you on the right track, tell you what to do, keep you going. That's their gift. That's their gift. And so the church has what's needed, but if we're not willing to share anything, how do we get healed? If we're not willing to speak the truth, we're not willing to share the truth. But it says, confess your sins. Put this stuff out there. You'll be healed yourself. Don't hide it. 
divide it. Don't hide it, divide it. You won't forget that. That's why I said it that way. Don't hide it, divide it. Guys, you know, our church is, is growing in a lot of ways, a lot of good things God is doing here. But we still need to be on the cutting edge of what God intended church to be. And what he intended church to be is a safe place that when you have issues or whatever, you can come and share those. And it's supposed to be a place where when someone else has an issue and they're proud about it and they don't want to deal with it and they got a bad attitude, he said, you should be mourning. And what you should have did after you mourned, you should have got them out of the church. Okay? So we talk about repentance. Do we want to repent in this area? Do you see what I'm saying? The local body does get in your business. The local body is, is to hold us accountable. The local body is to speak the truth in love. That's what it's supposed to be about. Folks, come on now. We want to really go on, don't we? Time's running out. We've got to move beyond being church attenders. We've got to move beyond being church attenders. Hello? The body of Christ is not to be attended. It is to be lived out. Do you see it? We want to move beyond that. And so he says, okay, we're looking at this thing. We're still in verse 2. We're looking at these attitudes of the church. They were, they were arrogant. They, 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 they should have mourned. And they were passive. They didn't care. They didn't do anything. So now we get into verses 3 and 4. And, and, well, verse 3 anyway. And that's the improper response. The improper response is to do nothing. To say it's somebody else's business. It don't concern me. That's the improper response. So then we move on. And then in um, the next verse, we see that Paul comes up and he says, Here, here's the proper response. For I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed this as though I were present. So here's the proper response. Paul's saying, I have already made a decision here. I've looked this thing over. I've judged him, okay? I'm present with you. I'm not there with you in body, but I am in spirit. I'm all in. He said, I've judged him who's committed this as though I were present. So he said, I've made a decision here. I've done something, Paul is saying. So then we get into the next few verses there, and he, he's come to this verdict, okay, and he, he, he's talking about what needs to be done. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I've decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I know we've heard the verse many times, but I'm trying to make sure you're hearing the word of God, okay? So he's made a decision, and he says, okay, here's what you need to do. He says, here's how I want you to um, carry this out. He gives a command. I want you all, when you get together, okay, first off, verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus. It doesn't mean Jesus, Jesus, just say the name. It doesn't mean that at all. It means in or by the authority of the Lord Jesus, deity, Jesus. It's saying, this is how we're coming together on this. We're coming in Jesus, by Jesus' authority. This is something that Jesus endorses. He's going to provide the power to do it. And when you are assembled, he's saying assemble. So what that means is you either do it right here when he was reading the letter, or you do what we call a call meeting. Call a call meeting, and you know, we're going to have a call meeting. Or the next time you get together for church, when you assemble, he says, I'm going to be with you in spirit. And you have to remember, and the Lord Jesus is there with you as well. Don't forget, the local body is Jesus' sanctuary, the Holy of Holies. We've already covered that in the first four chapters. When you go into God's sanctuary, God is there. He's trying to paint this picture. God is there. The Lord Jesus is there, okay? And so he says, here's what we're going to do. Deliver such a one to Satan, okay? Deliver such a one to Satan. And what does that mean? Boy, that starts to get a little, a little deep, doesn't it? It's to be a little bit deep. So he's saying, deliver the, the one to Satan. From what we can understand, he's saying what you need to do is put him out of the church. And you need to put him back out there in the world, in the culture. Are you understanding? Now, we got to be careful. I don't want to go overboard. But, you know, you have to understand, there are some blessings for you, even as an unsaved person, when there's a Christian in the house. If it's, there's some blessings in that home because somebody believes in God in that home. There's a blessing in that church because somebody believes in God. 
You know, there's a blessing on your job. Everything's going against you. All hell is breaking loose. But there are people on that job who are being blessed because you're there. There's some things. It talks about in the marriage. You marry somebody unsaved. The unsaved people in your house are being blessed because of the saved person. There's a lot of this that goes on, and we need to really understand this. So what he's saying is, you know, we're going to put you out there, and you want it, you're going to have to deal with that. You're going to have to deal with that. And so he, he gets into it. Put him out. You know, deliver him to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. We, 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 we struggle here. We're not sure if flesh means his body, which means that he could be having health problems once he gets out there. He could even die. Or are we talking about that part of us that hooks up with sin that we're always doing the wrong thing, you know? And so it seems like most likely that's what he's talking about. You get out there long enough, and what you thought was so fun and you couldn't wait to do and what you were doing is rebellion, you get out there and you get all of it you want and all of a sudden it's destroying your life and you want to get away from it. Let me go somewhere where I can be set free. Okay? So bring Bible now, Ron. Make sure we bring a Bible. The prodigal son. Do you remember? Got all his inheritance, went somewhere, did the whole thing, did all the wrestling he wanted to do and everything else he ever wanted to do. Comes up, looks up, he's eating with pigs, he's a Jew, that's terrible. Man, the worst of slaves at my father's house had more than this. I'm going to go back. You know what? I think I'm going back home. I'm going to tell my dad, you don't even have to claim me as a son. It was better there than here. Sometimes that's what needs to happen. We are, in a sense, given over to the thing that we want so bad, and we have learned the hard way, I, hard way, I really don't want this. I can't stand this. How do I get free from this? And that's how sin is. You know that, right? It, it, it's enticing and it's enjoyable and then when it becomes an addiction it's a slave master beyond compare and so he said you know we would, we need to put him out there in that territory that's where he wants to be okay and satan hates you as a christian so he would love to let you get out there in his territory so he can destroy your life and then have people talking about you laughing about you writing about you and how hypocritical you were and all these other things he's going to make sure that all gets out there and so he says, put him out there for the destruction of his flesh. Something good can come out of this. Okay, put him out there. Not trying to kill him, not trying to be too hard on him. But folks, this is kind of a Bible thing here. You got to understand, sometimes you got to put the problem child out of the house so you don't destroy the rest of the children. Do you see? This is a problem child. And, and Paul is saying, I'm not going to let you destroy that whole church. Okay? So put Ron Fox out, staying with our illustration, so that all the people sitting here today can go on with God. Do you see what he's saying? Sometimes you have to do that. And it's hard, but you have to do that sometimes. And that's what's going on here. And so it is a blessing to be around God's people. Do you remember Joseph, all that he went through? In the Old Testament, all that he went through, he was sold, jealousy, envy. His brother sold him. Gets down there, the lady lies on him. She wants to go wrestle with him, and he says no. So he ends up lying. She lies on him. He ends up in prison for attempted rape, all the stuff that he went through. Forgot about. Did the right thing. Always paying. Literally left his clothes there, his coat there, so he wouldn't get in any trouble. Did you catch it? That God blessed everything Potiphar had because of Joseph. Potiphar didn't believe in his God? Not at all. Potiphar didn't even believe his own wife, if you look real closely to a certain extent. But he was blessed because of Joseph. Being around Christians can be a blessing. It really can. And so there are things there. So it's like, no, we can't have this in the local body. Okay, so we've got to get him out of here. And it says, so that his spirit may be saved. From all we can tell, this man was already saved. Okay, but he's not living this thing right. He's not doing what he should be, and it's not, he's not being given up on, but let's put him out there. This is a serious go get a switch. And we have to be careful here. Is this apostolic authority that Paul is using? Is this something the apostle Paul is doing at this particular time? You're going to see some things here as we get into this, and we talk about right division of the word. We talk about handling the word accurately. Even in Paul's epistles, you'll see some transitions. And I've been trying to help you guys to remember, we only have three written books so far when this is written. Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and this one. They didn't have the Bible. They didn't have 1st Corinthians at all. So whatever he was telling them, 
him, it is the secrets or the mysteries or the truth of God's word. They didn't have something to go look up. So when he said something, they needed to believe what he was saying because it was coming from God. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the apostle of grace. And God is giving him this gospel of the grace of God. And he's getting a little bit here and a little bit more here and a little bit more here. But it seems like early on in this thing, whether you were Ananias or Sapphira or you were this man, there were times where God did not play. And we're still wrestling with, did people die in the communion? You know, but, but the communion thing, we're, we're wrestling with all that. You're all the way up here in this grace right now. Amen? You're all the way up here. I don't think anybody's dying because of communion that I know of. Oh, I know we're not dying for lying up in the church. Because we do that automatically. How you doing? Fine, fine. Too blessed to be stressed and too stressed to be blessed. And all the stuff, all, you know, we got all that stuff. Lying, know that you just, just came, you know, lying. And God didn't say, why do you lie to the Holy Spirit? Bam. That's a Don Wright quotation. Bam. You know, you know, you know God is, is gracing. We've all lied. Up in here, up in here. Well, when that had happened with Ananias and Sapphira, it was instant death. This guy here, oh yeah, we've done some stuff. We've done some sexual immorality. And we weren't delivered to Satan that I know of. Hello? That I know of. Oh, we come to communion. We come to communion living with somebody. We weren't killed and took communion. Because you don't want nobody to think you're not right. Are you hearing me? This is real stuff, guys. And I'm including myself. I hope you see me humbling myself here too, okay? And so he's saying, you know, um, no, you're going to do that, that his spirit may be saved in the Lord Jesus. There's a day where God's going to do the books. Remember, this book has been saying, quit judging folks wrongly. And um, wait, God's going to take care of that. He's going to get everybody's motives, what they did, why they did it. He's going to bring the, the hidden things to light. He's got all that taken care of. He said, that's going to happen. And so there's what, what, what we see going on here at this particular time. I don't know for sure if it wasn't just his apostolic authority, but we got to come away with this. Don't get distracted sometimes by things, but we don't want to be planned church. We don't want to be planned church. That's what we need to get out of here. All scripture. You can get something from all scripture, but this is a very a significant time. Historically wise, like I said, we didn't have this completed word. You and I have this completed word. So we got, we know now, you know, we have information, but he was laying this thing out. We don't know if this was apostolic authority. I don't mean to pick. I ain't trying to start nothing. I ain't trying to be fleshly. But, you know, we got too many people around here talking about their apostles. Folks don't really understand what an apostle was, what an apostle is. You're an apostle because you're a sent one, but you're not an apostle like the 12 and Paul. You don't call stuff out and say, go, you, you don't do that. You don't heal people. You don't do all these things, do miracles, raise the dead, all of that. You haven't seen Jesus. Those are the qualifications for an apostle today. I know there's an apostle at every church. I know they're on your TV. I know you're listening to apostle. I know you got G genogenic. I know all these folks, Fred Price. I know these people are all apostles. We got them here in Denver too. Get your body of Christ downstairs on your way out and see how many apostles are in there. And there's female apostles on the, in there as well. Some of them are even married. Folks, this is serious, this apostolic authority. This is not a new title. You're not a pastor. You're not an elder. You're not a bishop. This is not a new title. That was a position and an office. And it was very specific. Authentication. We're coming from Almighty God. We're all apostles in the sense of sent ones, but that's not what I'm talking about. There are men and women who are claiming that they are apostles, just like we're talking about here, that they have the authority to tell you, I've thought it through, you do this. Jesus will be there. We don't have that kind of authority anymore. Are you seeing? And so he says there, this is what I want you to do. So now we change, and I thank you for your patience with me. Now, in the last two verses, or three verses or so here, he addresses immorality in the church by using this illustration of leaven. And so, as we get into verse 6, he's basically saying, your boasting is not good. 
it's not good that you're boasting. It's not good that you're talking about tolerance, that you're talking about we, 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 we live out our liberty in Christ and we don't put in, everybody's welcome here no matter what they do, no matter how, and you can do anything you want and we're not going to say anything. He said, that's not good. You're bragging about this. It's not good. We got somebody that's a congressman in the church, but he's living with his stepmother, but he's a congressman. Some of us, um, politics gets us where we look the other way as well. Hello, we look the other way um, because, oh, this person, a politician came in, or an athlete came in, or a successful businessman came in. No, we're all the same here. Amen. The standards are the same for everybody. You can't let somebody else do something just because they do something else for a living. Just because you do something in the world does not qualify you for a position in God's sanctuary. He has qualifications for the positions in his sanctuary. It's not what does the world say about you and you come and put it in his sanctuary and we all bow down. Amen. I think it was just this week. Did you get that? Justin Bieber. Is that how you say his name? Uh, is that how you say his name? I can come up with somebody else besides him. But man, he's at a Christian church doing a concert and saying everything but Jesus. Hello? And no lifestyle to go with it. But he's a famous name and he'll fill some seats. Are you following? Folks, we really want to be the church God wants us to be. It's not about filling seats. It's not about buildings. It's not about giving. It's not about uh, comfort. It's not about parking lots. It's not about Mary and Barry. It's not about being part of a club. It's about being the church, the body of Christ, and taking our marching orders from him. Amen? Carrying out his vision and what he wants. And his thing here is relational. It's body life, one another. That's really what the priority is to be, doing it in love. So we close out, and he says, you shouldn't be proud. He says, you know, um, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Now, this will be easy for you. Th what he's saying is this might have been a saying they had at that time, but we have these same sayings, you know. Uh, he's saying a little affects a lot. You know, one apple can spoil the whole barrel is how we would say it, okay. Um, you ever open the strawberries up in the little plastic things, and there's one with mold on it? And then the next day, they all have mold on them. You thought you could sneak it through and slip it back in there, and they all have mold on it. That one moldy strawberry will mold the whole container. All right, are we following this? And this is one of Don's, Don, Don Wright's favorite sayings, but I'm going to reverse it on him today because it's Bible. One monkey can stop the show. Can I get an amen what the text is saying? One monkey can stop the show. So in our illustration, you leave me up here and I'm doing all this mess long enough, I'm going to shut this whole church down. It won't even be a church anymore. I don't know what it'll be, but it won't be a church. I can affect you. One person can affect us. That's what he's saying. Don't you know a little leaven will affect the whole dough, you know, the whole lump. And so what are we talking about here? For someone that may not know, we have some young ones here. Um, he's talking about leaven, or he's talking about yeast. And when you put yeast in dough, it makes it rise, okay? And he's saying, all you need is a little, and it'll make it rise. It'll make something way bigger than it is rise. And so he's saying, and he's using this, and what he's saying is, don't you know this man is going to affect the whole church, and y'all bragging about it? That's what he's saying. No. It's going to affect the whole lump. So then we get into verse 7, and he tells them what to do. Basically, what he's saying in verse 7 is get rid of the yeast. Get rid of the leaven. Clean out the whole thing. Get rid of all of it so you don't have any in the house. Are you following that? Now, please keep in mind what I said. We come to church with problems. Oh, Lord, help us share them. Lord, help us get some help. Let's be there for each other. Be honest with each other. I'm struggling. This is what's happening with you. I have this. I'm, that's where we want to be. What we're talking about is somebody that doesn't want any help, undercover, you know, whatever the case may be, and it's not the right way. So we want to be a church where we can share. We got we to gotta get that right. But we don't want to be a church where, you know, I just refuse, and y'all need to bow down, and it's my way or the highway, and, and you know, I refuse to repent. To get me out of here okay get me out of here okay and then remember it's not just to throw you in the trash and forget about you it's so you can get out there really see what it's like and see if you really want to be there amen you're sitting here today we're closing up i'm getting long but are your regrets you have any regrets 
Isn't it the stuff that you knew you shouldn't be doing, but you went on and did it anyway? Isn't it those things? How many of you regret being a good student? How many of you regret going to class? How many of you re regret going, getting your education? How many of you regret um, doing the right thing? How many of you regret, regret doing what your parents were trying to get you to do? It's the other things. It's the other things, like Ron Fox being at Manuel High School over at Fuller Park instead of in class. You see what I'm saying? Ron Fox hanging around with these wrong kind of people. Ron Fox hanging around with these wrong kind of young ladies and Ron Fox doing stuff and influencing other people. Ron Fox doing the wrong thing. Ron Fox leading out in the wrong. Those are the things I regret and I think about. It's not the things I did right. Amen. What about you? The things you're regretting now. Amen. Some of you are sitting here and I regret marrying this person too. Mm -hmm. I see it. I see it. Oh, that's, we're going to be real, right? I see it. I see it. Okay. He said, clean it out. Get over it. Okay. Let's, let's do it. Let's just, he says, you are in fact unleavened. Okay. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. We want to start over. You are unleavened. He talks about who they are in Christ. You are clean dough, positionally. You are righteous, you are holy, you're the apple of God's eye, all those things. Those have not changed. They have not changed, okay? You are still that. He says, you in fact are unleavened, for Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. What happened is, you remember, is that the week before the, we're talking about the Passover, you go back to Egypt, the, um, the uh, angel was gonna come through, and if you didn't, blood marked on your door remember there was one on the top two on the side you marked it with blood when you had that he would pass over you if you didn't have it the firstborn in there was going to die so the week before god called them out and said i don't want any leaven or yeast in your house for a week yeast represented sin yeast represented disease but the biggest thing that yeast represents is pride and puffed upness I can do this, it's about me, um, you know, all that. That's what it represented. And this church we're dealing with is totally puffed up. And so God told the um, Israelites there, no yeast, what does that get you to think about? We're not supposed to be puffed up. We need to be humbling ourselves before God. He's the one who's taken us out of slavery. And then the lamb was sacrificed, a certain lamb, the blood was put up like that, and then they got ready and they had a, a feast time. They did some different things that they were getting ready when they were in Egypt. They couldn't feast. They had to pack it with them. But he's saying no puffed upness there. So as he got into this verse, verse seven, he's saying you are unleavened because the Passover Christ has been sacrificed. All they got was the covering. The people here in first Corinthians are learning Christ. The, that was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ coming and everything he did would really set you free and make you unleavened. You are where you need to be because Christ paid it all. Okay, that's you and I today. That's, that's it. We are those people. Christ paid it all. So you are unleavened, okay? Because Christ has been sacrificed. The price has been paid for our sins. And so therefore, let's celebrate the feast. They would have a feast time. And you'd get to eat. You just have a really good time together eating and all that. He said, let's look at this. He's not telling them to practice this anymore. He's not saying to practice it, but he's tying it into the past. He said, your Christian life now is kind of, I'm trying to create a, create a picture. Your lamb's been sacrificed. You're all right. You're now in the feasting time. You're in the good times here. He said, as we do church, let's do it the right way. Don't bring any of that yeast back in here. Don't return to the things you used to do. Don't go and think if I, I got to do wrong to get right or whatever the case may be. No, keep it the way God wants it to be. Keep it the way God wants it to be. And so is it, he's saying, no, you don't want to do that. Take the proper actions, clean it out, and let's do this thing right. Let's do the right operating procedure. Let's live like God would have us to live, okay? And so with that, he's saying, Get rid of the malice, get rid of the wickedness. Don't, don't, don't come live in this new way. Don't be feasting that way, but you feast in sincerity 
and truth. What he's saying there is be sincere about this thing, be genuine about it, have some integrity about your, yourself. And the word aletheia means truth, but it means reality. Live in the reality that God says. What does God say about you? What does God say about himself? Believe that, live in that, and bring that with you to the table all the time. Don't be bringing the yeast. Bring what God has said to the table. Believe him. And we say it all the time, act like what he says is true and trust God to have his way in your life. So he said, that's what we're doing. Okay. That's what we're doing here. Let's do this thing the right way. So with that, that's where we're going to end for today. We ask you to continue to pray for next week because next week here's going to be another one. You ready for this one? You know, anybody that's living a certain way and we'll let you read the text. Do you know you're not even supposed to be eating with them? We're talking about Christians, not unbelievers, Christians who say, I'm a Christian, you know. But, you know, so we'll get into that next week. So we definitely need some prayer, don't we? Trying to make sure we handle this, this word right. See, it's so different than being a church attender, isn't it? Do you see body life and one anothering? It is totally radical. You want to be a church, and we sure do. This is what God is calling us to. It's different. So we got to get on with him, as someone has said, get to know him so that our self-esteem and our, our, our view of ourselves and how we feel about ourselves and our good day won't be ruined if somebody doesn't like us or we reject us or don't want to hear what we have to say or reject God. And I can't say anything because I, I want you to like me. Are you feeling that? Isn't that why most of us don't do things? Because we want to be liked, including pastors. Amen? Including pastors. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you again for uh, this time in your word. And Father, we really do pray over the text. And we really do ask, Father, that you would just have your way in our lives, Lord, and um, do what you'd like to do with this text in our life, Lord. I think it. It, it hits all of us differently, and it should. It should be personal. I pray that your spirit will make it even more personal. Please don't let us forget what we've learned. I pray that he'll bring it to mind. And, Father, help us to see this whole thing that we are to speak the truth in love, and it's, it's really different. Um, sometimes the truth is not pleasant. Sometimes the truth means confrontation in a sense, and we have to do that as well. Father, we pray that you'll show us and continue to teach us about where Paul's apostolic authority was and how this is to be lived out. We did pick up today, we're to call a meeting and we're supposed to deal with these things, not one or two people. Then we know sometimes that as individuals, we're supposed to go to the person before it ever gets to be that big when we know. And so Father, we pray that we will handle that correctly as well. So Father, thank you for what you've taught us today. And we thank you for your mercy and your grace to each and every one of us. We have all received mercy and grace, all of us, Lord. Uh, sometimes we forget. Um, sometimes we forget, Lord. There is just no way that even I should be standing here in my own mind. So, Father, thank you for the grace and mercy, the love you've given all of us. So, Lord, help us with the boasting and the pride. Uh, show us that as well. And may we humble ourselves before you as well. We really would like to be the kind of church you would have us to be. And, Lord, we pray that um, we really will have a made-up mind and we'll allow you to really have your way, Lord. It's really not on us in a sense, but the cooperation is, the participation, the yielding, the following, submitting, the obeying is. And so I pray that we will do our part, whatever it might be, Lord, and we just trust you with it all. We pray for next week's lesson. Prepare us for that as well. Another lesson of dealing with Christians and um, how we live. And so we just trust you for that as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You all can remain in your seats. We're going to do our benediction, and then I am not going to forget Sherry Brooks today, if the Lord has helped me to remember. So here's um, a, a neat benediction. This is in chapter 16. This is the Net Bible, and um, I really like how it brings all this out. But this is kind of a thing to encourage us today. It's really the lesson again, but it's in an encouraging way, okay? So let's read this out loud together. Please focus and really take it in. Stay alert. Stand firm in the faith, show courage, be strong, 
Everything you do should be done in love. Amen. If you remain seated.